Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Vena, host of the Smart Tech Check podcast, which is being broadcast today via a LinkedIn Live audio event. Today is Monday, August 14th, 2023. Walt Mossberg is a longtime technology journalist and moderator from 1991 through 2013. He was the principal technology com uh, columnist for the Wall Street Journal. He also co-founded All Things D, Recode, and the D and Code conferences. I've been fortunate enough to know Walt for more than 25 years, which is absolutely scary. But I'm thrilled to have him on today's podcast. Uh, Walt, how are you? And welcome. I'm good, Mark. Uh, things are great. And uh, I, I, would, I would have guessed it was more than 25 years that you and I knew each other. I think actually it's pretty close to 30 because I think I met you when I was with Epson um, uh -huh. as a as a product manager. And we used to trek out to uh, your offices in D.C. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I love going to your office in D.C. because you had and you I, I you probably have stories about this, but you used to have this. It wasn't a, a large conference room, but you had all this gadgets and stuff that were sent to you for you to check out. You'd walk into that room. I think it was near Katie's area if i recall and right. uh, it, was, it was unbelievable it was unbelievable but i love doing it i especially loved even years later you know, because we've stayed friends when um i come out there i would do it every december you know and i did it for like what before the pandemic hit i think i did it for 10 or 15 years in a row where we'd have lunch right, right around christmas time down there yeah we would i look forward to it yes no we'll definitely do it again so how are you what, what, what are you up to lately what's for those people who don't uh, know you go ahead well, what, I, what I'm up to lately is uh, I'm in the leadership of an organization called the News Literacy Project, which uh, uh, helps uh, people, particularly students in middle school and high school, but also the general public, to uh, distinguish fact from fiction online, to, uh, to kind of think about what they're what they're sharing. Uh, we have lessons, uh, cr a whole curriculum for schools that teach kids uh, what to look for and and maybe to take a deep breath and wait a second before they share something that might be dicey, stuff like that. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and it works. Well, I'm, 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 I'm interested. We'll get into this in a second in terms of how that work that you do in that particular area kind of touches um, some of this uh, AI deep fake stuff. We'll get into that in uh, in a second. But um, but uh, how are you staying? You know, I know you, you, you're not regularly meeting with companies anymore like you did uh, with Apple and other companies like when I worked for Compaq and Dell years ago. But how do you stay abreast? I'm just kind of curious in terms of what is like a I mean, do, do you feel that you're, you know, that, that it's not your top priority? I know that's probably not true because I, I know that you love technology, but how do you kind of stay in touch with what's, with, with, um, and keep up to speed on things? Well, I'm still in touch with uh, some people from some of these companies. Uh, and um, beyond that, I, I helped to mentor the careers of a bunch of the leading tech journalists who are out there today i'm not going to name names but they're they're sort of the top people and um so i i'm in, i'm in touch with all of them uh and i uh i just i just i read the right what i consider to be the right the best the smartest people on the on the stuff that i care about which is primarily consumer tech well, you, you know, I have to tell you that I think some of the more fascinating work you did, of course, you know, the reviews and, 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 and content that you read over, over the years with the journal were, were, were amazing stuff. And I'm not going to, you know, go down that trail, but I think really you were a trailblazer in terms of um, democratizing uh, technology information in a way that wasn't being done uh, in the early 90s. I mean, if you recall, and you, you know this well, you know, when you looked at, when you looked at, um, publications like PC Magazine, Byte Magazine, God forbid, my, you know, which were, were really, really half those printed publications were ads, but they were really written for technical audiences. And you really, I think, you know, kind of uh, really set the tone for many other uh, future journalists in terms of trying to, you know, articulate, 
you know, complex technical topics in a very understandable way, which at that time was brand new. And um, but I but I really love the, the code conferences that you did, the D conferences. Were, and I went to a couple, as you know, I want you to share with the audience a couple of stories, some war stories that, you know, you've told me many of them. <laughs> some of them are <laughs> I'll let you choose which ones you want to tell. But maybe a couple of stories that would be kind of interesting that kind of gave insight into some of the more famous people you had at those events. Okay, well, you, you, I, I think you were particularly interested in Steve Jobs uh, at, at War Stories. Steve Jobs appeared six times at the D conference. By the time we had uh, started the Code conference, which was really essentially a name change at first, it was pretty much the same conference, it has evolved. Um, but by the time we did that, he had sadly passed away. So it was all yes. the D the D conference years, which were prior to uh, 2014. Um, so I'll just tell, I'll just tell you a story. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I think personally made the conference successful was we did not allow the, the speakers to bring slides. We did not allow that. I remember uh, that. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, it was an all interview format. They didn't know exactly what questions were coming. Uh, and some of them still did great. Uh, not just uh, Steve Jobs. I think Bill Gates typically did great at, at, at these. Some didn't. Uh, they weren't used to it. But we didn't allow slides. So one year, uh, it was Steve Jobs was there and he was coming on. And I think I was going to interview him by myself at that time. So a lot of times Kara and I would do it together. Uh, and uh, I walked into the uh, ballroom where the conference took place about an hour before we were going to go, going to start. And um, one of my staff, uh, uh, our staff said to me, Steve Jobs is backstage preparing 50 slides to use. <laughs> and I said, uh, man, I, you know, I talked to him just last week and reminded him that, of all the different policies. He, he had done it before. This wasn't mm -hmm. his first time. I reminded him of, of all the different things, including that we don't use slides. So I walked over to one of the, he had, there were two vice presidents of Apple people that directly reported to him, two of his direct reports, maybe they were senior vice presidents, I don't remember the titles, standing in that, in that same ballroom. And I knew both of them extraordinarily well. And I went over to the first one and I said, uh, I understand Steve is preparing a bunch of slides. And this person said, yes. I said, well, you gotta go tell him he can't use, remind him that he can't use slides, we don't use slides and that I, told them just last week. And this person looked at me and said, well, I'm not doing that. I can't tell him that. You're going to have to do it. <laughs> and I walked over to the other one. Uh, these are direct reports. These are people right. that he, Steve Jobs had known for many years. And uh, I said the same thing. And that person said the same thing to me. Oh, I'm not doing that. I can't, I, you know, I can't possibly go back there at this stage and, and, and tell him he has to throw away 50 slides. <laughs> You're going to have to do it. So I went back stage, went over to him. He, he definitely was practicing his slides and lining up his slides. You know, he had a team with him that was helping him. And um, I, I, I said, Steve, we talked about this just last week and you've been here before. We don't use slides. So whatever you're doing with these slides, you cannot use them on stage. Now, right. anybody who ever watched the Steve Jobs presentation uh, of a new product, and most famous one, I guess, is the iPhone, but any, uh, any of his spe Apple special events knows that he loved to use and design slides. That was his main thing that he used. Uh, and in fact, uh, I have been told that their, their presentation program, Apple's presentation program, Keynote, 
was really it just the code base for that started out as a special uh, uh, program that was written by the developers there at his request for him to do those presentations. That's how much he cared about slides. And I said, we talked about this, you can't use the slides. And he argued back a little bit, but not too much and because he realized that we had had a deal and uh, he didn't use the slides. But I think there's a lot of parts of that that are interesting, including that he tried to get away with it, including that the vice presidents or whatever wouldn't did, were afraid to try to tell him no. I mean, it was, and, and including the fact that he, you know, I, I mean, he could have said, well, I'm not going on and, and, mm -hmm. and just walked off. And, uh, and then I'll tell you one more quick story because uh, we have other things to talk about. I know uh, about the conferences and uh, famous people. So uh, what you do when you have a conference, Mark, I, I know you know this, and many of the listeners probably know this, is you have to get a video release uh, for when you're going to put it up online. Yes. And right. uh, whether, whether it's live streaming, which we didn't do at first, nobody was doing live streaming at, at the time. Uh, we, we would, we would uh, so a couple of weeks after, a couple of days after we'd put it up, uh, whether you're doing that or delayed, it doesn't matter. You need a video release. And so we sent video releases to everybody that agreed to be interviewed on stage and or do a demo on stage, whatever. And everybody sent them except for two people. Every year, every time. The two people were Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. Arguably the two most important uh, tech executives uh, of that time. And I think uh these are you know, as we know these are historical figures in the development of tech even now but they wouldn't sign it they wouldn't sign it until they got off stage and then they would consider signing it and i think it would depend on how they felt about their performance which was not good for us because it was great for us that we had them as guests it brought in uh, uh people buying tickets. It brought in a lot of attention to the stories we wrote and the videos we showed, but it wasn't good for us if we couldn't show the, the, the interview. Right. Right. <laughs> and so every year, Kara and I had to go backstage and uh, have a little uh, session with each of them, uh, convincing them that they should sign the release. And they always did sign the release but they wanted to put us through it, I think. And, uh, you know, they, their PR people were embarrassed. They wanted them to sign the release, uh, but uh, I think they enjoyed putting us through it a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. And, and well, I have to add, just I want to be equal opportunity here. And if you don't want to tell the story, that's fine too. But you have to kind of, if you can, if you don't mind, so we're, we're equal opportunity here is the, the Taco Bell story. Oh, and, my God. Well, that's a little bit of a longer story, Mark. And I, and I know we here, have give, give, give us a time, minutes. but I'll, I'll give yeah. you the, I'll give you the uh, quick version. Um, so I, people think, <laughs> think of me as as ha as having a close relationship with Steve Jobs and I did but what they don't understand is that I had almost as close a relationship with Bill Gates uh, I spent hours and hours and hours and hours talking to him uh, in Redmond in DC uh, mm -hmm. at conferences I mean during CES several times we went off and had two hour lunches and um, and uh, one year, and, and every year I would go to Microsoft 
and I would spend two or three entire days seeing uh, their new products, meeting with product managers, sometimes engineers, uh, and sometimes higher up executives, some of their uh, uh, bills. Uh, this is when Bill was running the company, but even, even after when Balmer, Steve Balmer was running it. And uh, I would see some of their direct reports. I would see a whole range of people and I would see a lot of future products under NDA. And uh, uh, then toward the end, I would always have a meeting with Bill and it would be a long meeting uh, because Bill and I like to, we argued a lot. I mean, real hand-waving arguments about things, and but we also had calm discussions about things. And he would want to venture sometimes far from tech. There were a lot of things we talked we talked about. And uh, one year, uh, I was told that Bill was going to take me to dinner to do this. We were going to do this over dinner. We'd done this once before. We'd gone to dinner, and that's another story. But um, he. He, uh, so we, I got to his office and we started a talk and it was a very engaging, interesting conversation. And he never mentioned leaving for dinner. And I didn't mention it either because I was just wanted to keep the conversation going. And the phone rings and it's Melinda, who was then his fiance, maybe. And she said, why are you still there? Why haven't you taken Walt to dinner? Because I knew her too. And, mm -hmm. and he said, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I, he puts his hand over the, this was not, he was not talking on a mobile phone. This was a landline right. phone in his office. He puts his hand over the receiver and he says to me, uh, you know, I forgot to take you to dinner. I'm so sorry. I said, ah, don't worry about it. It's fine. So he, he says that to Melinda, but she's, and, and then he hangs up the phone. He says, well, we've been here like almost three hours. She, she says, I got to come home. And then he says to me, but I am going to stop at the Taco Bill Bell takeout window on my way home. If you want to come with me, I'll buy you a Taco Bell. And then I can tell her I took you to dinner. Oh, my God. And I said, I'm thinking about it's whatever it was, nine or 10 o'clock at night by then. Uh the, somehow the Taco Bell window at that time did not seem particularly appetizing. And so I said, you know what? I, I think I'll just go back to the hotel and have room service. I, I'm fine. <laughs> and and so we, then we leave his office and he says, oh shit, wait a minute. And, he run, and we're, we're like halfway down the corridor and he runs back into his, he says, I don't have any money. And I, now he was at the time the richest man in the world. And I said to him, uh, well, I can lend you 10 bucks for Taco Bell if you want, you know. He says, no, no, I could take care of this. And he runs back in his office, comes back waving in triumph a $10 bill. And we went off into the night. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. But, you know, let's flash. For, that's, that's a great story, by the way. When the movie version is made, I hope that story shows up. Um, the question I do have for you, and it's a, real, a bit of an unfair question, well, but you're you're probably best equipped to answer it. You know, you know, Jobs died. You know, uh, two thousand eleven. Correct? Am I mistaken? No, two thousand eleven. You're right. Right. Now that's been you know twelve years ago. If he was to look at Apple today, and again, I know it's this is a very hard one because it's a, it's a speculation based question. But you spent a lot of personal time with him. You had the long walks on him because he was fond of doing that with uh, the people he was trying to, um, you know, trying to coax and trying to convince that you know he was right about his particular point of view on whatever the topic was. What do you think he would think of Apple today? What, you, what do you think? His, if yeah, you, it's, you it's really back? hard to predict because, among other things, he was very good at reacting to changes in the overall uh, environment of, of tech uh, around him. And so he certainly would have uh, been aware of things like, uh, you know, the, the tremendous surge in social media that has taken place since then. Um, uh, you know, the, the XR stuff, the AI stuff, all that stuff would have been in his mind mixing around with 
with what products and what moves he wanted to make. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, you know, I can't predict like people sometimes say to me, well, what product would he do? What product wouldn't he do? Yeah. Would he have ever done the AirPods? Well, you know, I think probably would have done the AirPods, but I, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. They did actually have a Bluetooth uh, uh, earpiece uh, briefly when the uh, during the iPod period, um, and he once told me he was persuaded to do it and he hated it because it was one more thing to charge, and uh, um, they dropped it. I mean, it, it was it was not a hit, and they dro dropped it after I don't know a year, uh, but. Uh, uh, I will say this one thing. Uh, Steve never cared very much about the stock price or the market mm. cap of the company. Yeah. He did, I mean, the company was in, as you know, in dire financial straits when he came back uh, to lead it. And I'm talking now, not about his first period of founding the company and running it for a while, but I'm talking about when he came back to rescue the company and when he un veiled all those historic products in the in the 90s and two early 2000s and the late 90s and early 2000s and um he never he, I, I in all the dozens of hours of conversations that i had with him he never ever mentioned the stock and he never mentioned the market cap uh there was one occasion when they passed microsoft's market cap and anyone who knew the history knew that that was a big deal that would never have been predicted. And um, he did send a note, I think, to the to the to all the employees about that, but that was it. Right. In fact, he was so uninterested that he never even joined the quarterly earnings calls with analysts, which is almost unheard of for a CEO. He never joined them. He, yeah. he except for once when they when they had some problem with the antenna on one of the phones, he got on there to to try to knock that down and explain it and all that. But that was it. And he never right. joined the, the call. He didn't care about it. He didn't right. care about it. And I so I think one of the big differences is the current leadership under under Tim Cook, who I repeat, I, I remind people was Steve's handpicked successor. Yes. Uh, the current team has done tremendous uh, financial work. They've paid a lot of attention to the financial results of the company, to the, you know, the, the margins, to the, to the bottom line, to the top line, to, to the stock price. You know, they have this huge shot, share back, uh, buyback program they've been running. And, uh, you know, they, they, Tim has personally, and his team has personally paid a lot of attention to those financial and business kind of factors. I don't mean that Steve didn't care about the business. I think mm -hmm. he cared about the business and the results of the business. And he never wanted to be in the kind of dicey position Apple had gotten itself into by the mm -hmm. late 90s. Yep. And he liked accumulating cash, uh, which is why they still have a, a, a large amount of cash. But um, uh, so I think that had to be one of the bigger differences. He would have been much more focused on the next product and the next product and the next iteration and, and that kind of stuff. Well, before we take some questions, I, I have to get this in because you, you and I haven't talked in a few months and I'd love to get your perspective on this. You know, a few months ago, Apple announced their Vision Pro, which I, you know, I think, you know, from my perspective, you know, it, it really was that their approach to AR and VR, I think was markedly different from what, you know, you've seen Meta do with Oculus and Quest, which, you know, has been middling from a success um, standpoint. But, you know, what's your thoughts on Vision Pro? Do you think it's, a, you know, it seems that the, 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 the technology community is kind of split down two lines. They either think it's going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread from a technology standpoint and open up the, the mainstream consumer market, which really, as you know, AR, VR is really not a, a hardcore consumer play right now. Um, or some folks are on the other side saying, you know what, 3,500 bucks, not going to sell a whole lot. I, I think we could debate that, but nevertheless, you know, they're, they're less enthusiastic. You know, your perspective, where, where do you come at it? Um, well, first of all, uh, uh, I think the technology 
the way they've executed is way above what Meta has done, way above what anybody else has done. And uh, that's a terrific foundation for them. Uh, I completely 100% agree with you that this is not going to be a consumer product hit for broad mainstream audiences. Uh, yes, the price is a big factor in that, but I also think there's another factor, which is uh, except for uh, super enthusiasts, developers, and in, uh, using that kind of a, uh, a tool, um, you know, th there isn't a, there isn't a use case for it that will uh, uh, compel people to want to go out and buy it even as the cost comes down. I mean, mm -hmm. the cost is a huge barrier right now, but I'm quite sure that they can get the cost down. Uh, obviously, that somewhat depends on the volume, so it's kind of circular, but I think there's other ways they can get the cost down, and they are acutely aware of it, and they're working on that. So I think the big question about Vision Pro, and any of these things, but particularly Vision Pro, is the use case. Mm -hmm. uh, they showed a lot of use cases in their demos, some of which were productivity. You know, they showed using Office uh, with with spreadsheets floating in the air and all that kind of stuff, and how you could use it with just hand gestures. Uh, and they showed, uh, you know, media consumption and gaming and things like that. And I, you know, people sometimes turn up their nose at media consumption, but it's an enormous driver of 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 tech uh, hardware and software purchases. Uh, we're doing it right now in a way uh, through software. Uh, but, um, you know, what do you think people use their iPads for? What do you think they use their iPhones? What do you think they use their Android phones for? Um, and what do you think they, you know, game, if you think of gaming as a kind of media, it's all, there's a tremendous amount of media consumption. I personally uh, think one of the biggest use cases, particularly given the vividness and the high resolution that Apple has been able to achieve, that I think goes way beyond what what other people have done, uh, and and the spatial sound and all that kind of spatial audio and all that kind of stuff. I personally think a huge um, uh, connector, a huge or a huge use case that might work would be uh, concerts and, and, mm. and, and big, big entertainment events and sports events. Um, you know, this summer we've seen Taylor Swift and Beyonce have these huge concert tours. There actually are a lot of other artists out there doing uh, big concert tours who haven't toured in a while. And the, the tickets are very expensive and it, it, you have to often have to fly somewhere to go see them. And it winds up costing a lot of money. They mm -hmm. could charge, you know, a hundred bucks a pop to go to watch that through uh, Vision Pro and get, you'd get a, a tremendous 360 degree experience with fabulous video and the whole thing that you can't get in 2D watching it on YouTube or on, you know, even the high, high uh, resolution documentaries that I think both, uh, Swift and Beyonce are planning to put out. Uh, and so I think that could, that could be a compelling use case and that goes for sports too. Yes. Uh, I was just about to raise a professional sports, I think. Well, those and are, those are kind of the same that. thing, professional right. sports and, and concerts. I mean, it could include classical concerts too, whatever, any kind of concert that, or, or, or event, uh, 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 you know, Ted talks, whatever it is, uh, if you, if you feel like that you're in the room, uh, which, which I think Vision Pro can do for you, uh, that could be a big use case. That's just my, my feeling about it. But I, I agree with, with you basically. I think we're talking about a long game here, yeah. or at least a medium game. I don't, I don't think this is, you know, when, when it first goes on sale, it's, it's gonna be very limited. I think it'll sell in, the hundreds of thousands, not the millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions that Apple is used to. And I think they know that.
I yes. think they know that for this first iteration. And yeah. So, so let, let me. Yeah. So I want to make a one a one last comment before Don Don McGuire, the CMO at Qualcomm, wants to pop in in a second and ask a question, which we will in about fifteen seconds. But the only comment I would make is that I I agree with you violently, Walt. That if you look at it from a technology ingredient standpoint, this thing is no Oculus or Quest. I mean, it's literally a a five K TV. You know, from a resolution standpoint, that's the LCD technology they're using, and, and it's so immersive that it's actually kind of um, disorienting. You know, I think that I, so. It's, it's I think it's a completely different type of device than the other products that are out there. But let's let's let Don step in if we can to ask a question. Yeah, I do see that, but it's not letting me to do allow here. That's interesting. Yeah, that's really weird. I wonder if we've got too many people here. Um, yeah. Okay. Glitches in software. I can't I, believe it. I, I can't. important as that is, I worry much more about misinformation and disinformation. This is going to, to uh, 
kind of turn on the afterburners, kind of really multiply. It's going to be a multiplier for a lot of good things, but it's going to be a multiplier for people that want to deceive you, whether it's to make money, whether it's to get elected, whether it's to disrupt our elections. When we're talking about foreign uh, 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 agencies and and governments uh, intervening, because it's going to become, it's not, we're not quite there yet. You can't, there are ways, uh, and we do, we uh, advised on that at the News Literacy Project, that there are ways still, luckily, to tell if something has been uh, done by AI. Uh, it's not easy, but it's possible. I think pretty soon it may not be possible, and that is, is going to be horribly disruptive of uh, uh, our our society, our democracy, and our political system, and not just ours, but all the other democracies around the world. Uh, it's it's a big big worry of of mine and of a, a, a lot of people's. You know, images are can be faked, text can be faked, video can be faked. Uh, whether it's intentional or unintentional, a so-called hallucination. Uh, and uh, a lot of it will be intentional, I think. And that's that's my worry about it. But, but well, but don't you think that, you know, because video is such a different ball game when it comes to the deep fake um, issue and that it can affect so many, you know, not just the politics, and that's a completely different discussion, but it could have an impact on people's lives because it, it, it can persuade people that something that's not true is true, you know, the deep fakes in terms well, of- Well, that's funk. what I'm talking about. That's what Yeah, I'm yeah. Talking. Yeah, and I, I guess my point is, don't you believe, because if you wait for government to get involved to, to kind of set the agenda for what the technology companies, they're always a dollar late and, you know, a, uh, and, and a dollar short as far as I'm concerned. Do you think that the, the technology ingredients company have a responsibility, frankly, to create some type of the, you know, deep fake techno, um, detection capability that the average user? Oh, a uh, uh, hundred you know, percent. They yeah. absolutely have a responsibility to do it. And, uh, you know, to create an AI tool to detect uh, misinformation and disinformation in in text, in photos, in graphics, in video, in audio, and every other form of of uh, content that you can see on uh, on social media, in particular. And um, uh, yeah, I'm a hundred percent with you. Uh, I'm speaking for me now and not the organization uh, News Literacy Project, but uh, I think they have an absolute responsibility to do it. The problem to get back to government is they t some of them may be highly, I don't know all the people involved. Some of them may be highly ethical and may not need any prodding to want to do this just for the good of all. And some of them may, may think correctly that maybe the technology and the business opportunities won't take off as well as they might unless they do put in this kind of um, countermeasure uh, against uh, uh, misuse of, of, of generative AI. Uh, and then a third group are, are going to need to have to be worried about the courts and the and and the, and the, and the government, uh, the Congress and the executive branch doing something about it. So there's a, there has to be incentives for them to do it. I think there are enough incentives. I just haven't seen it yet. And um, sometimes I read articles that say it can be done and other articles that say, oh, it's, it's not likely to be technically possible. I don't know, but people have to be trying really, really hard. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the feedback you generally get when I ask the question is that it's not foolproof, but I would rather have a capability that's 80% or 70% confident than, you know, than, hey, I'm, not, I'm just going to leave it up to the, uh, the person who's viewing the content to make that decision. So I, yeah, I, you, I know, so I'm, you know, I'm at that point of view. Uh, again, we're not, we're not, for whatever reason, we're not able to get the chat working, but if you want to send me a message in LinkedIn very quickly, I'll try to read your, I'll try to read your message. Uh, Sam, you want to do that for for uh, Jim?
Well, Jim, uh, thanks for the question, uh, particularly under these circumstances. Um, uh, I basically, I agree with you. There are, I don't, I, this is going to shock people. I don't regard, and I never regarded the BlackBerry as a, as a full-fledged smartphone. I mean, eventually it became one after the iPhone and the uh, Android, first Android phone came out a year later after the iPhone. But um, the BlackBerry that people loved on, on Wall Street and law firms and some consumers was primarily a closed email system. Uh, and it was very effective at that. And that was the thing that, you know, it had actually, as you know, evolved from a pager. The Trio was... Uh, a, you know, a a uh, a smartphone, and and that was the thing I carried uh, until I switched to the iPhone. It was the Trio, and uh, it had apps. It had uh, the capability uh, eventually to do some uh, wireless communication, and uh, I mean uh, data communication, and um, it uh, it was there, but. Um, it, you know, it had a, a, a hard keyboard, which didn't allow for a lot for a big enough, a big screen, all the things that Jobs went through in his introduction to the iPhone. So, you know, the iPhone was clearly superior, but I agree with you that the trio was it. And I don't think that the founders of that company uh, and the developers of the trio and the Palm Pilot before it, namely uh, uh, Jeff Hawkins and the CEO, Donna Dubinsky, and the marketing guy, Ed Colligan. I don't think they get enough credit as we look back at tech history for what they did with both the Palm Pilot and later the Trio through changing companies to Handspring and back to Palm and all that. So I agree. We're trying to get uh... Don's question in uh, manually <laughs> for, from there. Okay. Good idea. <laughs> you know, Walt, I, I, I absolutely could ask you a question about the Boston Red Sox and the New York Yankees, but I'm not going to do that. Well, uh, there's not I, much to say, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> about either of our team. We know uh, listeners should know that Mark and I have had a friendly rivalry about this uh, for many, many years. And it is friendly. Um, but uh, <laughs> Most of the time. Most of the time. <laughs> but the, these, these teams are, uh, both of our teams are doing not well this season so far. So well, I don't think well, there's much, much to discuss. Yeah, last night's game was a uh, horror show. If you're a Yankee fan, the Yankees were down, uh, I think, five or six runs. They were up five or six runs in the ninth inning, and they lost them to Miami in the bottom of the ninth. So that was a very depressing evening. Um, uh, Sam, any, any success? With the, yeah. yeah, let me see if I can do that. Sure. Uh, what was the last part to I think he is what? Well, uh, I think it's all been bad. I think it's been terrible. I mean, I, I, I'm against letting bigots and Nazis back onto the platform. I mean, they were, they were not doing a great, a, a fantastic job at content moderation before, but they were doing uh, uh, some, and uh, now he's erased all that, fired the people, let all these people back in. He himself has made some some comments that are, uh, uh, I think, uh, 
uh, reprehensible, uh, 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 even if he didn't intend it. Uh, and it's and the whole thing has been chaos, as you, as you know. I can tell you that in my own case, uh, because I'm de I'm declining to pay for a, a kind of fake verification system, and I had a, a a check mark that I never even applied for that Twitter just, I mean, it landed on my account one day ten years ago or whatever. Uh, I don't have that anymore because he took all those legacy ones away. But but unless you pay him, uh, you don't get, uh, you get kind of downgraded by the algorithm. And so my experience there has been significantly degraded. And I'm, I am there, but I'm there, uh, I don't know, 80 or 90% less than I was. Uh, and so uh, I don't think under his leadership and ownership, uh, uh, Twitter has done any done anything but go down in uh, value, and I don't mean monetary value. I mean value to the users and value to the advertisers. Uh, in terms of whether he will create an all-in-one app, I would say first of all he's got to get people to want to be on Twitter again, for that for Twitter to be the kind of destination it was at its magical peak. And he's he's actually driven it down from that, so he's got to get it back to that. I I, I think it'll be it would be interesting to see him uh, make it a a place for e-commerce, make it you know kind of make it into a WeChat kind of thing. I'm not sure, and I mean this when I say not sure. I don't mean no, and I don't mean yes. I don't know the answer as to whether in uh, uh, Western markets, uh, and particularly the United States, uh, people want it all in, in, in one app. Uh, you could at Google, Google and Apple and, uh, you know, I don't know, LinkedIn could do it. Uh, uh, these new competitors to Google could do it. Facebook has some of this already built into it. You know, there's a Facebook marketplace and stuff like that. Uh, there are other people, it's not such a hard technical problem to build all these things in. It's a hard execution problem and a, and a su sustainability and imagination problem, I think. So, um, yes, the answer is he can try that, but I think he has to, he has to do, undo a lot of the damage he's done to Twitter already. Guys, uh, I um, I did make Don a speaker. Sam, I don't know whether we can add him as a speaker, but I do have his question, which I probably could save myself a little bit of time. Um, Walt, are you there? I'm there. This is Don's question you're reading? Yeah, this is this is Don's question. And Don McGuire, uh, Walt, is someone I've known quite well. He's the CMO at Qualcomm. And his question is, do you think that implementing a hybrid AI architecture where on-device or AI at the edge, which will provide better security, IP protection, and user control can contribute to solutions that can address concerns over Gen AI, not to mention the carbon footprint issues um, of 100% cloud-based AI. So he's asking a very, I think, um, intelligent question. And that is, you know, can we, can we address some of these issues that we're talking about vis-a-vis -vis having the capability really on the device itself, which by the way, um, Qualcomm is, you know, really playing a leadership role in that area. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's a good, I think it's a good idea. I think it's the, you know, he won't like me using this comparison or maybe he will, but you know, this is the kind of thing Apple does with, uh, um, a number of other stuff where they, where they have, uh, uh, sometimes to their detriment, uh, but, uh, in terms of, of opportunity, but, uh, uh, to their benefit in terms of people's perceptions of privacy and security, they put a lot of things on device uh, and less in the cloud. And it's it's still hybrid, but a lot is on device. And so mm -hmm. I I think it's great. And I think for all the reasons he's talked about, you know, the carbon footprint and the other stuff. Problem is, I don't see how that solves the misinformation problem. It solves a bunch of other problems that he delineated and I want to make it clear that I, uh, I recognize he didn't say it would solve the misinformation problem. 
I'm just emphasizing that it does not solve the disinformation, misinformation problem. But anything that solves any problems with any emerging technology is great. So, I, you know, I'm for that. No, I, I you know, I don't quite, I follow Qualcomm quite well and I engage with them quite a bit. And I must say that um, they are acutely aware of some of the challenges here. And I think the on device approach is a, is a very strong step in, in the right direction. I don't think it's the only thing that you have to do. But I do think it's something that, um, you know, that's important. And, and Qualcomm is really taking a leadership role in that, so given their presence. Um, uh, in the I program. generally support doing as much on devices, particularly when we're talking about mobile devices. I, I support doing as much on those devices, particularly vulnerable stuff uh, or, or stuff that causes other problems like uh, carbon uh, uh, footprint problems. Uh, I support doing as much of that on device as possible. And so I'm, I'm with him. I'm just saying, <laughs> whether it's on device or in the cloud, somebody can use generative AI to create false information. And uh, to me, that's, uh, that's an enormous problem. And also the jobs issue is not solved by that. But, right. you know, it's not on Don's shoulders to solve all the problems. So if he can solve three of them, that we haven't talked about, uh, I'm for it. Well, you know, I, the one thing that's nice about Qualcomm is that uh, there is a genuine concern about this because they know what's, what, what's at stake here. Uh, Walt, we've almost gone an hour. That's double what we thought we were going to go. I don't want to keep you here for the uh, for the entire afternoon, although I'd and I have, do have to run. Yeah. A any closing comments? You know, uh, before we kind of sign off. Um, I, I you know. I'm going to use my closing comments to talk a little, little bit more about news literacy, if that's mm -hmm. okay. Sure. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons I retired was so that I could plunge. I was already on their board, but but much too busy to do much. Uh, now I'm very involved in uh, every aspect from fundraising, uh, uh, which is something I really couldn't do much of because of the ethics rules around journalism before I retired. Uh, fundraising to other leadership roles and decisions that we make, uh, like any organization. Uh, and the reason is, I think that uh, we are we are all acutely aware, whatever our politics, we are all acutely aware that our democracy is kind of needs shoring up, needs saving in some ways. And um, I think that uh, misinformation and disinformation are enormous parts of the problem. And so one of the, the, the News Literacy Project has a digital curriculum that's all about this, like conspiracy theories is one lesson. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, just all kinds of things to tell that, teach kids not what to think. We, we, have, we are completely nonpartisan. We do not tell kids uh, uh, what to think, who to vote for, anything like that. But we do tell them how to uh, critically evaluate something that they see uh, before they go on and reshare it and before it affects their overall uh, view of the world. And um, that, uh, if they use those tools, they might come out as a as a Trump Republican, they might come out as a Biden Democrat, they might come out somewhere else, but that's not, that's not our problem. That's not our right. thing that we're gunning for. We just want people to be able to know that what they're looking at is reliable. And so uh, I urge everyone who can to focus on that. Uh, and, uh, uh, at least try to get the next generation, in a in a headspace where unfortunately the current generations have been fooled uh, too easily. Well, that's a great way to end the uh, podcast today. Walt, again, thanks for being so generous with your time. Uh, for our listening audience, thanks for making the Smart Tech Check podcast part of your day or commute. Uh, if you've noticed, I've got some QR codes at the top of the um, of the uh, apparent, the image that you see on LinkedIn. Please subscribe to them to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Or follow me at X. I hate that name. I want to say Twitter, but I'll just say X. <laughs> at Mark Vina Tech Guy. Well, thanks again for your time. 
Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Samantha. Thank you.